next speaker is Robert Benjamin. who will talk about the evidence for spiral structure in the Milky Way. Okay, um, so uh, this is a little bit of history, a little bit of science. I, many of you know I'm part, I'm part of the Glimpse team, and I've been trying to find out what I want to do with my life. Uh, <laughs> now that Glimpse is disbanded, and it occurred to me at, from last meeting and this meeting that I, I may have something to offer to you, and you certainly have some things to offer to me. Um, so I'm going to go through evidence for spiral structure in the Milky Way, and before I get going, I just want to remind you that when we talk about spiral structure, we're we, that you have different components of the galaxy, okay? So you can talk about spiral structure in dust, spiral structure in star formation, <laughs> spiral structure. Um, and those components do not necessarily have to be exactly the same. I mean, they're usually related, but they don't have to be the same. Uh, so this actually is MGC 253, but you'll, if you look at this infrared image, uh, K-band, you'll see that galaxy is a lot smoother, okay? When you look at the infrared light, the, the, the total mass of uh, tracing the mass of the galaxy as opposed to the star formation. So bear that in mind as we go through. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about a history of spiral structure because I've come to love the history and I think it was sort of fun to know where we came from. Um, I'll talk about direct mapping of spiral structure in the solar neighborhood. Uh, then I'll talk about star forming spiral arms getting beyond the classic diagram used for galactic structure called the LD diagram and then talk find a shot with the discussion of stellar over densities in the field. Um, so, spiral structure history. In my opinion, have, having learned a lot, uh, the story of spiral structure in our Milky Way is an attempt to impose more order on the galaxy than it may deserve. <laughs> so, depending on where you go, you, you may find people, sometimes people think spiral structure, it's solved. You know, you, we've got this artist picture, it tells us where everything is. Other people say, we will never know what spiral structure is, and I don't even believe there's any evidence, okay? <laughs> and you'll find this diversity of opinion out there in the community. I think the answer is somewhere in between. Um, the story, the modern story, started in, in 1950 when Bada actually took an H alpha plate of uh, M31 and noticed, you know what really traces spiral arms in M31? H2 regions. So he actually suggested to both Oort and uh, Bill Morgan at Yerkes Observatory that they try to find H2 regions in the Milky Way, estimate their distances by getting the photometric distances to O stars and make a map. Um, and that was actually something that was taken up by Mil Bill Morgan. But even at the time, uh, <clears throat> Bonnet gave this talk in 1950, just before the, all the, the, the action began. He said, of one thing we can be as certain, on account of heavy obscuration of the planet Milky Way, we'll at best get only a glimpse of short pieces of such spiral arms. And one guess we can probably safely make that our sun is located in a spiral arm because the brighter B stars and dust surround our sun in all directions. I know this argument will not overly impress you. And that, that you would like to see the arm or a piece of it demonstrated ad oculus, meaning to the eye, uh, so would I. So that was in 1950. And in 1951, uh, all heck broke loose in, in mapping the galaxy. Uh, this is actually a paper, uh, by the way, you can't tweet this or distribute it. I actually bought the digital rights to this. I found this um, <laughs> on Getty Images. This is a picture taken on December 1st, 1951, on the steps of Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, about 30 kilometers from where I teach. Uh, and from left to right is Chandrasekhar, Bill Morgan, Kuiper, Strongren, and Ort. Okay, so you probably know all of those names. <laughs> and, uh, and they were there. Uh, Ort was actually in the United States to give a talk at the AAS meeting on galactic structure. But at this point in 1951, Bill Morgan had actually made his first map of spiral structure. Ort and his team had detected H1 um, earlier that year for the very first time and was about to start mapping the Milky Way and hydrogen. And so they talked about their results in the Yerkes. And then a, a couple weeks later, they met again in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, along with a box. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Bart Bach and Priscilla Bach, a uh, great story. They actually, um, Priscilla Bach was actually a professor at Smith College, a former student of Shapley's. And she, uh, she went to Leiden for an uh, International Astronom Astronomical Union meeting. Um, Bart Bach was assigned to her as a grad student guide. Um, so he met her at the train station and said, well, here's where your hotel is and everything like that and brought her around. At the end of this conference, he asked her to marry him. <laughs> and she said, I don't think so. You know, he, she's a professor. He's a grad student. When, uh, she, but they did communicate and Bart Bach actually got himself transferred to uh, work with uh, Shapley in the United States. And then they did eventually get married. And together they co-author a series of books on the Milky Way. And you can actually see the evolution of our understanding of the Milky Way by looking at those five editions of the book. 
But the night before Morgan made his announcement, Morgan actually sat down with them in the dorm room on, on their bed and gave, went through the whole presentation. And what Bill Morgan presented was, it was actually a three-part discovery. First, they use a wide field camera to get uh, an H alpha filter to get H2 regions in the Milky Way. Then they ide identified O and B stars in the directions of those H2 regions. They used extinction corrections from Washburn Observatory, which is in Madison, Wisconsin, to get the, the extinction correction. And then they grouped the O stars into like groups of four, eight stars, and then measured the average distance to those stars. And Bill Morgan basically made the very first map of the Milky Way, which actually was a physical object, a board with nails pounded in it. Uh, then he put little white uh, cotton balls on and then took a photo of it and presented it at the meeting. The board is actually on display in Adler Planetarium, if you ever go to Chicago. Um, so anyway, so this is the first map of spiral structure. Um, Morgan actually had a nervous breakdown that summer and it took a few years for him to publish it. Um, but the results were eventually published in uh, 1953 by Morgan, Whitford, and Co. And so what they saw in that, in that first result was they, if this was the sun, they saw a band here, a band here, and this was actually not presented in Cleveland, but it was added later, uh, a band here. So this was going to be, if the sun, galactic center is this direction, so this is the local arm, the Perseus arm, and the Sagittarius arm. That was the beginning of it all, okay? Um, so, just a, a quick digression, um, it, the camera that, that, that was used to identify the H2 regions uh, was a camera that was built at Yerkes, um, and, uh, and it was actually used by Morgan, uh, yeah, Morgan, Sharpless, and Osterbrock. And uh, so in the process of doing this sort of historical research, I said, well, what happened to that camera? And it turns out, uh, I found the camera. It had been actually misplaced, and where it ended up was down the hall from my office in Madison. <laughs> uh, because a professor in, in, uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin, Art Code, uh, borrowed the camera from Yerkes in 1952 and never, or 1953, and never gave it back. <laughs> uh, and it lingered in a closet for the next several decades. Wow. Uh, and it was known that it was an interesting, uh, an important camera, but it was not known that it was used to mess that spiral structure. So I discovered this a few years ago, and we sent it back to Yerkes Observatory, where it belonged. Um, so anyway, uh, going through the history of spiral structure, um, the, basically, this is 1951. So you had the detection of 21 centimeters, the first evidence for spiral arms. Uh, the, the arms were initially named by Ort in collaboration with Morgan, okay, based on some the, the three directions they saw. Um, then, and then pretty rapidly with the, the H1 coming online, you had evidence for something called the Scutum arm, the Carina arm. The Norma arm is interesting. It was actually first discovered on the basis of two absorption lines in a B star in the fourth quadrant. And so, uh, so basically William Thackeray said, ah, oh, two absorption lines at minus 80. They must match with those two absorption lines in the first quadrant at plus 80. And that must be a spiral arm, which he named the Scutum Norma arm, okay? And, uh, and then you have uh, the outer arm in 57, the three kiloparsec arm in 50, uh, 57 as well. Um, people were sort of going to town on this, and then, as many of you are aware, uh, the attempts to match spiral structure ran aground, particularly because people starting with the same H1 data set were getting different structures for the galaxy. So there was a lot of bitter fights, uh, and the field was really starting to collapse. Um, there was actually a shootout at 1969 between two different groups. Uh, Weaver and Kerr had very different maps of the Milky Way. They actually met again the next year to try to duke it out and figure out why are they getting different maps. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so by the time people started to, to detect CO in, uh, in 19, uh, 1970s, um, some people were keen, yes, CO will solve the mystery of spiral structure. And other people were more skeptical. So in 1983, Harvey List said, and this was not in a happy way, the newly begun process of deriving microchore from CO seems to be recapitulating the history laid down by the H1 observers. That was not, not a positive statement. Uh, but at the same time, Bart Bach was, was optimistic. He says, the forearm four spiral galaxy deserves a careful and sympathetic examination. So in the same year, you had optimists and pessimists. Um, and the field sort of bogged down for a while. Um, but after that, um, so, and I, I will fill you in about that some. But then recently, okay, starting in the 2000s, there's been more structures added. Okay, so the, the, the H1 distant arm, the far three kilopars from the outer students and stars. All these things come from the LV diagram, which I'll get to very shortly. Uh, but what we ended up with is something like this. 
This really incorporates the standard picture, okay? Um, it's the best attempt to try to get square these, this model with idea, but the model fits um, inexpertly on the data, okay? And so be aware that this is a model and if you see <coughs> things that don't fit, it might not be you, it might be the model, okay? So evidence for spiral structure. Um, I'm gonna whip through this, but the, 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 you know, the general non-axisymmetric distribution of OB stars that was seen by Morgan in 1951, that general pattern has remained stable over the decades, okay? So I'm just gonna try to convince you of that very quickly. Um, this actually shows the sun, uh, sort of a plus or minus three kiloparsec boxer in the sun. Uh, this is actually modern data, and you can actually see the error bars here. These are parallaxes to masers. Many of you are aware of the, the Bessel project to map the parallaxes to masers in the Milky Way. Okay, if you don't, it's a very important galactic structure thing because the point is these masers have parallaxes um, because you can measure micro arc seconds. Uh, and so you get very, very precise distance to objects through all the dust, way beyond where Gaia can see. Okay, so it's a great reference set for testing ability to measure distances. <clears throat> now, how many people see spiral structure in this picture? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone want to step? Okay, let me color code them. Do you see spiral structure now? <laughs> okay, the color coding comes from associating these measures with where they are in kinematic space. So you can group these objects kinematically and say these are the velocities um, of these things, and these things group together in kinematic space, and these things group together in kinematic space. And so that kinematic association between the objects that you're looking at and uh, is absolutely is crucial to trying to pull out structure. Now, just to, for fun, I overlaid the original Morgan objects. So these are the original Morgan um, local arm, Perseus arm, and Scutum arm, or Sagittarius arm. Pretty close. Yeah. So we haven't really shifted since 1951, ultimately. <laughs> but we have more certainty. Uh, this is the same picture over roughly the same area. Uh, this is actually O star parallaxes from Gaia. You may not see patterns, but what I think you might convince you see is you can see some gaps like here and here, right? Okay, and you see trailing arms. Um, so there's the majors overlaid. Um, and then finally, this is actually a map of uh, the surface density of the galaxy in red giants, which looks sort of smooth with some exception of the area around the sun, okay? Which you expect. The red giants should be a smoother distribution. And here's the uh, distribution of upper main sequence stars. Same pattern, right? Boom, boom, and boom. Okay. And so, uh, so I would say that this is, this is evidence for spiral structure. It's not overwhelming you with the detail. And hopefully the guy will give us more information on the, the detailed structure of these things. Um, but we'll see. And then, by the way, these are some two, two examples of dust maps that have come out in the last year using Gaia uh, to, uh, to get distances of stars and looking at the extinction versus distance. And so basically one map from Rosine Lelamont and a second map from uh, Greg Green. I'll blink them a second. You see generally the same things. Some differences to worry about. Okay, um, so that's near the sun. But what, you, what I think is most important for this group is to understand that if you're trying to link your objects to galactic structure, remember that spiral arms, don't, don't look at the artist's picture and say, well, it's, this is the right distance. What you should do is get a kinematic association between your cluster and an H2 region, for instance, and then look at the LV <coughs> diagram, because the LV diagram is where those arms came from, right? So look, the face on map is, is a garbled version of that, and an over-idealized over one. So let's talk about the LV diagram very quickly. Uh, this just shows a 21 centimeter uh, Leiden Argentina bond survey of the H1 emission as a function of velocity VLSR and galactic longitude. And uh, I think many of you hopefully are aware of how this works. Um, but kinematically, what's happening is you have gas allowed at certain um, sections of kinematic space depending on where you are in the galaxy. So just going through it quickly. If you're inside the solar circle, inside the sun's orbit, the sun is down here going this way, then you would be in this part of the diagram, right? Uh, basically everything would, should be redshifted. And then <coughs> if you go to the outside the sun's orbit in the same quadrant, everything becomes blue shifted. And then the blue shift continues 
because the sun is moving to the left, so everything in that direction is blue shifted. Then it's red shifted in the third quadrant. It's uh, in the fourth quadrant inside the solar circle, it's blue shifted and then red shifted outside, right? So by looking in this diagram, uh, you can sort of see where you are in the galaxy, okay? Um, but as many of you know, the problem with this diagram is even when the presence of perfect circular rotation is double value. So these lines show lines of constant distances. And you'll notice that in this quadrant and this quadrant, inside the sun's orbit, those lines overlap, right? Meaning if you pick a point like this one, okay, it lies along the green curve. So it could be at a distance of say 12 kiloparsec, but it also lies along the purple curve which means that it could be at a distance of two kiloparsecs, right? And so this is the, the dreaded kinematic distance ambiguity. And that's what uh, clusters are, can be useful for is if you can associate clusters, for instance, with H2 regions, H2 regions have a kinematic distance ambiguity, but clusters can tell you uh, that it's not. Um, by the way, that was a big problem. So a lot of times in galactic astronomy, people, this diagram is single value. Sorry. I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this diagram uh, is single valued in radius. So even though it's, it might be near side or far side, it, it's, you know what the radius is for perfect, perfect circular rotation. So at any rate, um, so this is the 21 centimeter diagram. And as we move into the CO era, let me just show you what happens to this data. OK, I'm going to blink it just a second. What you see, two things I see is if you go here, you've lost a lot of emission here. Did people see that? Let me just blink it in this upper, upper right, lower left corner. So you can see more emission in H1 than you really do in CO. And that's because the CO clouds are on the far side of the galaxy and they get beam diluted and faint. Okay. But the other thing is you might see that a sharper pattern here. Okay. Do people sort of agree with that? The, H, the, the CO looks sharper than, it, than the H1, although there's some similarity. And so with this diagram, the, the trick of finding spiral structure in this diagram is to see, can I find coherent bands in this diagram? And that's what people did even before the HCO era. Now, this is where we are heavily biased by finding what we expect to find. For a perfect spiral arm tracer, um, a, a, a perfect spiral arm, and these are just examples of arms in physical space and how they would translate under perfect circular rotation to kinematic space. For a perfect circular, a perfect spiral arm tracer, you would have emission only following these loci. Okay, mm -hmm. so you get arcs and loops in the LV diagram. Um, you would get that half of the galaxy is disconnected from the other half because you can't tell it when you get too close to the galaxy which track you're on, especially with a little bit of smearing, right? So this means there's always been a problem in the Milky Way of linking the fourth quadrant and the first quadrant in terms of the coherent structure. That's why non-kinematic distances are important. But the most important thing in terms of skepticism or belief in this as a, as a thing is there should be gaps along what's called the terminal velocity curve, right? Because if, if, you're, if, if your stuff is only in spiral arms, there really shouldn't be any emission here, even though rotation would allow you to exist there, right? And so the, the optimist of spiral structure said, I see patterns in this diagram. The pessimist of spiral structure says, how in the world could you have patterns when you know you're filling in all sorts of space where you shouldn't have spiral arms? Okay, and so, so this is really fundamental. You can see this, this diagram is half full or half empty in terms of its implications <laughs> for spiral structure. And that's why we are where we are. So, um, so this is an observational attempt to, and this comes from a paper by uh, Reed 19, 2003, where they actually sort of have their best modern guess of what the LV loci are observationally, not theoretically, but observationally. So they say, ah, we find these concentrations of molecular gas along these loci. And these are the arms that we have come to know and love, if you know and love arms, okay? <laughs> and uh, by the way, I wanted to point out that one, like, I, well, one of the talks earlier, I was like, oh, VVV cluster uh, 88, it turns out to be associated with this wise H2 region. Okay, so I can basically locate it kinematically in L space and B space, and it's right here in a, in a place that would be somewhere in between the scutum arm and the Sagittarius arm, if you believe this, this association, right? 
But it's, it's something to bear in mind as you, try, as you look at clusters. Try to link your clusters kinematically to what has been known, because it's this diagram that has, gives you some continuity to the sense of the galaxy, rather than a collection of objects. Um, and so now, you, if, you don't, if you didn't know about the Maser program to determine a parallax distance to Masers, you should, because um, they're super important. You have basically high quality points that tell you the distances to all of the stars here. All these stars are measured major parallaxes. And so you know the distance and you can compare the, 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 the kinematic distance to the true distance and see, is there deviations from our expectation of pure circular rotation associated with these objects? And as it turns out in the inner galaxy, yes, as you get closer to the bar, there's evidence for a kinematic deviation. But the other area of major kinematic deviation in the Milky Way is the Perseus arm. Um, where we see it along the Perseus arm in the outer galaxy, the gas clearly is not at the expected rotational distance, okay? Uh, so inner galaxy, Perseus arm have deviations, but you'll notice that there's not much over here because the Maser Parallax program is based on Northern Hemisphere telescopes. And so, but there's nothing special about Masers. They're not magical. I mean, basically any point that you have where you believe the distance, and then you can put it on this diagram, constrains the, both the, the density of the galaxy and also the, the, the kinematics of the galaxy, whether or not gas is rotating in a circular pattern or not. So if you find all the clusters in this section, get their distances, believe their distances, prove your distances work, uh, you can play the same game as the major parallax people. And in fact, there is overlaps between some clusters and some majors which lie inside clusters. And those are the most important objects to study to make sure that the two kinds of techniques systematically get the same result. Um, so this is everything that I have found that was tended to be useful in terms of <laughs> the red points are different kinds of tracers of star formation. The, uh, the, the blue points are different types of molecular cloud surveys and the yellow points are measures. The stars are the ones with the parallaxes. And you can see, I, I'm gonna blink this, they do sort of follow the low sign, right? So again, the point of this is the patterns persist, okay? The patterns are always there. We just have to understand them. Um, I'm gonna skip through a couple slides. So, um, so what, do you, what do you need to do to help in galactic structure? Um, the LBV diagram tells you what objects are connected to each other because you can build strands of objects. Like actually, uh, if you know the lobster nebula and the, and the cat's paw nebula, and I forget their NGC numbers, they're clearly connected by a long molecular filament. So they belong together, okay? It's, they're not just two independently random star formation regions. They are, they are causally related to each other. Um, you find them on the LBV diagram. You associate these H2 regions with clusters or stars. You estimate the distance to each object. Parallax when possible. That's possible now out to a larger distance thanks to Gaia. But at the very least, all, all basically distance estimates should be parallax calibrated. I mean, if you have a distance to a cluster, you need to convince me that it works for things where we already know the distances through parallaxes, right? Um, the cons of this is that photometric distances will always have problems. They will not be as reliable as parallax. The pros is thanks to Gaia, they're getting better. And thanks to VVV, we can extend this old approach to the inner galaxy, right? So, so the point is, is there's a lot of opportunity here. Although I would never encourage anyone to do their thesis on galactic structure. I think it's, it shouldn't be your day job. Uh, by the way, at one point, uh, at Bar Priscilla Bach, she uh, turns the end of Bart Bach's, or middle of Bart Bach's career, Priscilla Bach said, Bart, get out of galactic structure. The future is in star formation. <laughs> and he followed her advice. He actually said, that's it. We're, I'm, out of, I'm out of galactic structure. Until the very end of his life, he didn't go back to it. At any rate, um, I'm going to skip through this. But inner galaxy is where you, I would encourage people to start. So last comment, stellar over densities in the field. Are they real or are they spiral? This gets to the question is, does the Milky Way have spiral structure in the old stellar disk, in, in, the, uh, in the red giant? This, the, the part of the, of, the, of the galaxy is traced by red giants. Um, only VVV and then Glimpse and, and you kids have the ability to detect this field star over densities beyond the solar neighborhood. Because of course, up, just like Bada said back in 1950, you know, we're limited in the optical to a small section of the galaxy. Um, so there's been a lot of work on stellar kinematics lately. Uh, the problem with the stellar kinematics based on Gaia in terms of its implications for spiral structure 
is uh, the kinematics can be explained by spiral arms, the bar, interactions in the Milky Way. There's been relatively less work on over densities of stars in the disk. Um, so, but the expectation based on looking at other galaxies is you expect typical arm interarm contrast in the mass density to be 25%. Um, and that is what people have claimed over the several, there's basically a few lines of evidence, but none of them I think very convincing or conclusive uh, that there are over densities of stars in the disk. Uh, there was tangency over density. Centaurus has been seen by several people, including me. Um, Sagittarius has been seen by one group, but not in glimpse, so I worry about that. There's field star over densities in the Perseus arm, in A stars, actually. Uh, there's a red clump over density beyond the bar that was first seen a hint of in 2011 and followed up in 2017 with the DVD paper. And there just, <clears throat> as of last month, has been a claimed marginal, they, that's the author's words, red giant over density in the local arm. Okay, using Gaia selected red giants. Um, but all of, and here's the data, which I'm just going to whiz by. So these, this is the over densities, these blue peaks are beyond the bar. Uh, this is the over density map of, of giants that would be associated with the low quorum. This is their completeness volume. This is the over densities allegedly associated with the Perseus arm, where it's exponential beyond, but you get a little hump there. Um, these are all claims. The problem is that they're all very piecewise. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you really need to build a case that you're seeing a more coherent pattern over a galaxy to convince its people that we, we know what we're doing. Um, and then that's actually, I think, what I will say. I do want to say that um, I am very, I am personally interested on in seeing if VVV can say more about this alleged over density in the Centaurus direction because that is, uh, this is the glimpse data showing star counts. And there, but there is a concern that there is also extinction window here. And so we, we, I do worry that, that I may have been tricked and others may have been tricked by an extinction window producing an excess in star counts. So, so that, that requires a little more work. So to conclude, I'd say the story of spiral structure is an attempt to impose more order on the Milky Way and reserves. The general non axisymmetric distribution in the solar neighborhood has been, remained stable from 1951, although most people don't seem to know that. <laughs> uh, spiral arms are really LV features in these diagrams. They're glued together through the, the, the center and anti-center. Um, but parallaxes, photometric distances, and 3D dust mappings can test this. And I think VVV can play a big role. And then finally, only the mid-infrared surveys have the ability to detect these stellar overdenses beyond the solar neighborhood. And Actually, I say one claim in particular because I like the Centaurus engine, but I think all of the claims deserve follow-up. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank Andre and uh, for organizing the meeting. And this was a great thing to wake, wake up to outside my my uh, my room this morning. Uh, so I stop. I figure I'll stop with that. Cool. Thanks, Robert. Very nice talk. Uh, questions? Uh, I have one. The, about 12 slides before, yeah. <laughs> there was a, um, um, what, what was it about? No, keep, keep going. Yeah. When you were talking about the velocity, yeah, one before, well, one before, one, that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what is this, or, or without the, because I, I, this is a correlation with the sun, but, but it, it looks like there is something coherent there. Mm -hmm. this, um, this, this structure here has been called the Lindblad ring. Um, and I, I think it's sort of been forgotten. Um, okay. Over here, you see the, over there, yeah, too. over here, um, I mean, I, what kinematically this would be guess is very, very local, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's near the sun. Um, but it's so one of the one of the interesting to me one of the most interesting things about this diagram is the fact that there are areas where we can see molecular emission where there doesn't seem to be any dense cores or star formation, yeah. right? In other words, th this actually does look like a gap in the tangent point, right? Like one might expect for spiral structure, and this looks like a gap in the tangent point. Um, but yeah, things down here are local, and things that are local, so in, or, in order to link them together, you have to link them across a large section of the sky. So, okay, so, so I haven't seen any claim that these things belong together, except for this, which is called the Lindblad ring. Right. And, and it was and modeled in the 70s and has been forgotten. So like many things in galactic structure. Okay. Thank you.
More questions? Nice talk. I was just curious, why didn't you use the CS service? There are very extensive CS survey from Rothman that are tight connected with 82 regions, which are compact 82 regions. They could be good tracer for, for what you are trying to. Which survey? CS from Rothman. Oh, the CS, yeah. The, yeah so CS. It, you mean is it using a CS uh, LV diagram or? No, CS uh, molecule. CS molecule. So these are point, these are in yeah, the trace. They're very good trace of uh, uh, ultra compact A2 regions that are tight connected to the spiral arms. Well, that's a, so yeah, I, um, I have a, a lot of catalogs and I've sort of tried blinking them. And this is the one, these are the ones that I, I found that had the largest number of objects uh, that. It, um, but I, I, I'm happy to try that catalog out. Yeah, I think that I, could, could help you to fill some of those gaps. And well, those yeah, gaps. it's a good question. I mean, it, it is, I mean, like this, this gap in particular is very noticeable, right? There's a whole area here of, of kinematic space where they're not finding any star formation or tracers yeah. of star formation, i.e. dense, dense cores. Yeah. The CS might partially fill it in, but then of course you're not tracing the star forming structure of the galaxy. You're tracing the denser gas structure of the galaxy. And those don't have to be the same. So, but the, but the comparison might be interesting. Yeah. Just quick one thing. What is the most distant maser? Oh, I, that actually, the distant, most distant maser, <laughs> that, that was the joke I skipped over. So, so here's a section of the sky. Uh, you know, in kinematic, so you, you would say, where should I start in terms of learning about all the clusters here? And it's immediately obvious to the eye the most important objects in this image, right, in this glimpse image. And the most important object is that one. <laughs> <laughs> and why is it that one? Uh, the reason that's the most important is because if we overlay all the things I have, all the white circles are clusters or cluster clank of a candidates. All the colored circles are H2 regions. Blue sources are molecular clouds. Yellow sources are majors. And then occasionally red sources are uh, other kinds of H2 regions. This has a maser. And the major has a parallax of, that puts it 20 kiloparsecs away. So it's on the far side of the Milky Way. And this is the cluster that we have been discussing. Yeah. And how, how unique is it? Uh, but yeah, it turns out to be an incredibly luminous maser. Um, and so they were able to, get, I mean, I'm amazed that they were able to get a parallax at 20 yeah, kiloparsecs. Yeah. Uh, there are very few, most of the maser parallaxes don't get you much more beyond, say, eight or nine kiloparsecs. So this one was sort of shockingly uh, uh, luminous. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, is it a variety of different types of maser they're using? That mostly, uh, it's methanol masers and uh, some water masers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most of them, I think, are methanol. And the methanol ones are almost always associated with high mass star formation. Although, except so, the ones that we looked at, and they weren't. <laughs> well, yeah. and there are some methanol ones that are also associated with uh, red supergiants, I think. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah, one thing I, I discovered when I was looking at the at the um, the Bessel projects is it turned out some of their some of these sources some of the yellow stars um, are actually red supergiants and you can actually look at the Gaia parallaxes to the red supergiants and then you can look at the Maser parallaxes to the red supergiants and it's an interesting question to resolve. So. Yeah. Well, some of them might be associated with massive star formation that we just can't see in the infrared yet because it's too embedded. I suppose, but, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean. We, we should be complete to every star forming region across the galaxy in the IR. Yeah. So it, just, it has to be lit up somehow if it's, too, if it's not gone bright yet, if it's a little bit of bright, but an IR bright. Then, right, right. Yeah. If, it has, if it hasn't formed a massive star that's starting to really heat up the dust, it would be invisible. It would only be visible as a core and not, yeah. a, not as an as a infrared luminous source. But anyway, so one thing I just wanted to say, offer to you guys is if you have a cluster and you're interested in it, does this cluster have galactic structure implications? Please contact me. I'll be glad to help. So. Thank you. Oh, just a quick, quick because it, it looks like this is a, all these objects are in the, in the near side of, of the bar. And the, the only background thing is that distant maser? Or, oh, no, no, no. Or no, are no. there um, any other objects? Well, let's see. Um, I can tell you because this is between four and a half and seven and a half. Uh, yeah, I see. So four and a half and seven and a half is um, here. <laughs> and so basically, we're looking through stuff that's in this region. 
Um, so there's not much, I mean, the problem is kinematically things are getting so compressed. So it's very hard to tell, to get things that stand out in distance. Um, I mean, it's, the, the velocity doesn't tell you, doesn't give you much leverage for how far you're looking through the galaxy. But again, um, non-kinematic distance methods could.